So our top, our top portion is called Teruma. Say that Teruma. Teruma. And what's interesting, remember the Bible is not chronological. Say that the Bible, the Bible. is not chronological, meaning this instruction, why did God put the construction of the Mishkan just right after the instruction of Mishpatim? So now, why are we going to see? We're going to see here a pattern. We're going to see a pattern because we like, like uh, if you go to the next slide, there, see, because we'll see here that that the, 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 the three chapters are dealing about the construction of the Mishkan. The construction of the Mishkan. So it's all about the materials, Exodus chapter 25. It's talking about the inner details of the furniture. It's also about the exterior structure, and then finally about the outer court. It's interesting, you know, you, you know, when you build a home, when you build a building, when you build a home, you never start with the appliances, <laughs> right? But in God's case, God said, no, start with the Ark of the Covenant. And that's what Peter read. He started the Ark of the Covenant. And from the Ark of the Covenant, everything else will be established. In other words, normally, the normal construction is you will start with the structure of the building first. Once you have the structure, then the last thing in your mind, say that the last thing in your mind is the appliances that will go there, right? But in this case, it's all about the art. It's all about the, 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 the foundation of, the, of Yeshua. It's all right. It's right there. Mm -hmm. And then he says, from there, then all else is all else, right? So if we go to the next slide. So we, we, we said last time, uh, Ramban uh, raised me, he said that the, the book of Exodus, there's really three interconnected themes. The first theme, of course, in uh, Parsha Shemot, and Bo is the redemption. So he's taking us from where? He's taking us from Mitzrayim. And, 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 then, and then where did he take us? He took us to our purpose, to our, to our um, purpose. And what is that? The revelation and the giving of the Torah. And then finally, this is the ultimate purpose. Say that the ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose on why God has given us his instructions why he's given us his Torah. You know why? This is the ultimate purpose. So that he can dwell Among in us. us. Think about that. So he, he, he cleaned us up. He redeemed us. Then he said, okay, here, here are my instructions. And if you follow it, then the ultimate purpose is so that God will dwell among us. We're going to see that. So there's three things again. Uh, we, we said that uh, Exodus, uh, go to the next slide. So we, we, we learned that in, in the Haggadah, when we, when we do a Seder, we know the, 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 uh, in the Seder, what you're actually being taught is it is as if you were enslaved yourself. That's why we do role plays. You know, you, you, you sit and you, know, you, you, you sit as if, and then you recline. Why do we recline? Because you're reminding yourself you're no longer a slave. You, a slave does not eat in the table. The slave does not recline when they're eating. All they're doing is serving. So, so on, 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 on the role play that happens in the Haggadah, it's reminding us. Why? Because the, the spirit, the, the power that God said, I gave you the power. Every, every time it's, it's Pesach, I'm giving you the power to be released from your personal Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim means, or Egypt means, constriction, means uh, blockage. There's something in your life that's blocking. If there's something in your life that's blocking, maybe it's, maybe it's unforgiveness. Mm. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, materialism, whatever it is, uh, pride, uh, whatever it is that, that God is not able to pour the blessing. So God is saying we need to be redeemed from, from that. We need to redeem our, we need to be free from Mitzrayim, our, our personal Mitzrayim. So every person have we all have our own Mitzrayim. We all have our own uh, things that maybe it's uh, you know uh, whatever it is, unforgiveness, like I said, you know, uh, maybe there's there's anger there. All these are Mitzrayim's. When Hashem liberated the Jewish people, he said, in this season, this is the season before 
the uh, the, uh, the, the, the the anniversary of remembering the the the, the, the pesa is God is reminding us, you know, we, we too can experience our personal exodus. That's why it's just, it is not just a historical event that we commemorate. It's also a person. That's why, you know, it's interesting because the, the Jewish say, and uh, we, we as believers in Yeshua, we believe it, that it's a personal deliverance. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, we make it personal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeshua set us free, amen? amen. And we make it personal. And, and every every Seder, you have to make it personal. So this is as if Moses, or in this case, Yeshua set you free. So, then, so, so again, there's a three-step process. And what's interesting is, our, you know, it's a, it's a spiritual journey. Step one is we identify whatever it is that is blocking God's blessing in your life. Whatever it is, you know. And then, the second step is we need to submit to his word. We need to submit to his story. We need to submit, you know, um, the submission to his will, that, that's receiving the Torah. And then once we have that, once we, we begin to, to, um, to acknowledge that, hey, you know, in order for me to get out of where I am or to do God's will in my life, a lot of people think, you know, I want to do God's will. How are how we going to do that? Some people think they have to go to uh, Africa and be a missionary to God. No, the two God's will is to obey what he said. Amen, his Torah. So then when we do that, we learn that when a person, you know, when we, when we learn to, to, uh, to, uh, to follow God's word, what happens? The ultimate, the ultimate, uh, ultimate purpose and why he wants to do that is he wants to make a tabernacle, uh, God wants to be a tabernacle in our life. The Hebrew word mishkan, the kasa, the, is, is, uh, it, it means a dwelling place. A dwelling place for God's presence is not really a building. So God is everywhere, but God doesn't want to be in the building. He wants to be where? In the hearts of each and every one of us. So God's desire is to make a dwelling place of his presence in this lowly earth. See, when God created the, the physical, this thing about why did God create the universe? Why? Because God is already, he's already God of the of the, the spiritual realm. So God said, you know what? I'm gonna create a, a physical world, a physical world. And with that, with when he did that, he said, I'm going to do that with one condition. I'm gonna get, make man. And he will, he will make the earth, the physical earth, a holy place. That's why, you know, in, 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 in what we believe, we don't separate the physical from the spiritual, meaning we, we embrace, just be careful, we, we don't move. We embrace the physical, meaning, you know, the, 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 the physicality of the world does not, we are not scared from that. Like, uh, you know, there's some religion that they have monks, that they segregate themselves and they, they don't associate with the world. He said, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. So God placed us there so that we can bring holiness wherever it is we are involved in, right? And we're gonna, we're gonna explore that, we're gonna see that. So, so in reality, uh, what he's saying is, uh, it's God's desire to, well, see, see this is the plan too. If you look at, if you look at, uh, in, 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 in the grand scheme of things, so it, Yeshua died, and then in, in, in four thousand uh, three thousand five hundred years ago, they received the Torah, right? But when Yeshua comes, we will be receiving the living Torah. Amen. So for a thousand years, the living Torah will be there to teach us, and then when we are ready. When we are ready, then God, you see in Revelation chapter 22, heaven will come down on earth. Think about that. So the same pattern, so it, the same pattern in Exodus, he redeems us. He gave us the Torah instructions so that God can dwell among us. So here, Yeshua died. Yeshua will return. He will become the, he, we will be receiving the, the living Torah. <laughs> The living Torah will teach us 
And then when we're ready, the final battle, after the final battle, what happens? Heaven will come down. Heaven will come down. Amen? Huh? Yes. So there's a famous story going next to Jesse. There's a famous story about, you know, uh, uh, from the founder of the Hasidic uh, uh, movement. He said, there was a, 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 a there was a girl that was crying, you know, and the parents said to her, "Why are you crying?" And the, and the girl said, "Oh, because we're, we're we're playing hide and seek." So what's wrong? And I'm supposed to be the one hiding, but no one was look, is looking for me. And wow, and 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 that lesson, because no one was looking for me. The lesson was, this is Hashem crying. This is Hashem like a little girl. Why? Why? Because he says there's in Jeremiah, even though you know God is, is hidden, but yet he allows himself to be found. Say that he allows himself yes. to be found. Yeah. In Jeremiah 29. For I know the thoughts that I think the righteous says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Then you shall call upon me. And you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken. Listen unto you. Verse 13. And God said, If you seek me and find me, then you seek me, and you shall seek me and find me, you shall search for me with all your heart. So Matthew 13 again. God is the one crying, you know, because people today are not looking for God. They're too busy. We're too busy for we have so we have, we have, you know with all this. These things happening, so many things happening, we don't have time. Again, the kingdom is, of heaven is like a, a merchant seeking good repair. He's seeking for the treasure. And then when he finally finds it, what does he do? He sold everything and bought that piece of land because that is where it's again an analogy, but it's it's talking about it's talking about, you know, when you find the truth. All things doesn't matter anymore. Amen. Yes. yes. You know, like all the noise, all the nonsense. Find the treasure. Doesn't matter. So one next time. So, so uh, we, we've seen this before. The gematria mm -hmm. again, because it connects. There's, there's, you know, when you when you when you're reading the, the Bible, you, you know, you, you need to go beyond the words. We need to understand the, what God is trying to convey because God is conveying multiple messages. And if we just read the, we, we read the text, we're missing a lot of the, the spiritual application. Like for example, the word Mishkan has a numerical value of 410 and it's connected to Kadosh, holiness. The word Kadosh is holiness and the word Mesha, which means to cleanse. And then the word Shema, which is means to hear so so what is what what why, why are all these words important why because it's telling us that when we hear when we hear and be the word of god it will cleanse us and if it cleanses us it makes us a vessel for god to be able to dwell among us see that wow say wow wow So the the uh, it, it, what uh, what Denzel read a while ago in First Kings chapter six verse one, it actually is a timetable because it says there that after four hundred and eighty years or four hundred seventy nine years uh, after um, they left Egypt, Solomon started to construct. The permanent tabernacle or the permanent temple, right? So, uh, so again, um, go to the next idea. See, so God, so when, when God asked them to build him a Mishkan, we're going to talk about, you know, what does God build a house? Why does God build a Mishkan? So, why does God build a house? So, so here we can see here that when God was speaking to the, to the instructions to Moses, he said, Tell the children of Israel if they for me an offering of every man whose heart make him willing. In other words, they were asked if it was a voluntary 
thing. So what so what God asked the people to offer gifts from the heart to create a place for him. Let them make for me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. So, so we read that, verse 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. So the Hebrew word sanctuary is the word mikdash, which comes from the root word kadosh, which also can be kadosh, be set apart, be sacred. So the, so the midrash is therefore saying it's a set apart place. So God is saying, you need to, if you want to create a place for me. I want you to give voluntarily of what you have, right? So we're going to talk about that later on. Because it's, it's, and then he says there, but I want you to set aside, I want you to be a set aside vessel. So what God said, that's the uh, sacred place within the heart of each and everyone. We, we want to create a special place for God in our hearts. So the purpose of the Mishkan it says here is, is to have a set of apart space for God to dwell in our lives. Amen. So go on the next slide. So again, the sages are saying that you know God did say, "I'm gonna uh, make me a tabernacle or a, a, a make me a tabernacle or, or a, a mishkan, so I will dwell in the mishkan." No, it says there that I may dwell in them, meaning in the people. So again, again, the, the text there says, dwell in them. Say that, dwell among them, dwell right? He didn't say, I will dwell in the Mishnah. He didn't say, I will dwell on it. God is saying, I will dwell in them. So, uh, because the text recognizes that God desires to dwell within each person in the, sanct in the sanctuary, the, 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 uh, the Mishkan is just a type showing the plan or to return, to return us to wholeness, and we weren't gonna discuss the the uh, the building today, but because there's five core portions that deal with that, we, have, we will have time to, to go back to it. But the whole principle is God is saying, you know, when you look at the design of the of how the tabernacle is laid, it's actually a pattern for if you fall, there's a there's a pattern on how you go back. So God is showing us because at the end of the day. He's showing us that he's not, he, he's not dwelling in a building, he's dwelling in each and every one of us. Amen? So he's, really, he's dwelling in our hearts. So it's interesting that the Torah portion talking about the building of the tabernacle of God is titled Teruma. Why is it not called the Mishkan? Right? Why is it not called the tabernacle of God? Why? Because God wants to emphasize that when, when he built, when he went to build a home for God, it has to come from a willing heart. Amen? Mm -hmm. Are you here so far? <laughs> so, again, you know, um, uh, God is emphasizing the importance of, of our willingness. Go to the next slide. So here, he's talking about the difference between a mishkan, say that mishkan, mishkan. and then the bet Hamikdash. Say that bet. Bet Hamikdash. So the Mishkan, as we know, is temporary. It moves around, right? Where was it created? It was created outside of Israel. In fact, it was in the wilderness for about 39 years, right? And then when it got to Israel, it didn't sit in in Jerusalem. It sat on Silo for, for about 440 years. And then there was war, and then they moved it to uh, Haran, and then from Haran, they moved it uh, uh, in the city of David, and then later on, when, uh, when uh, Solomon started his contract. So, so we see here that there's a difference, say that Mishkan, Mishkan. and Bet Hamidash. Bet Hamidash. The Bet Hamidash literally means the house of the holy house, or we call it the temple. Yeah. It's became the permanent place, right? So, you, so in in, in uh, first Kings, we can see the difference on how it was built. So the first Mishkan was built by donation from the heart, but the second one, the permanent one, Solomon taxed the people. In other words, you were forced to give, right? Mm. God used men and women with a willing heart to give their time and talent. Solomon hired foreign workers. 
God used the material that was or, that they already had. We're going to talk about that. Solomon imported many of them materials. He, he took it from many other places and brought it in. And finally, the people were united. They were in one. They came together. You know, it, it, you know, there's five core portions. And in all those five, you never hear the children of Israel complain. But in any other, there was lack of water, lack of food, whatever. They always complain. But when they came to the building of the Mishkan, not one person complained. In fact, Moses had to stop the people. You're giving too much. We cannot take it anymore. Amen? So uh, interesting because, um, again, uh, you know, the... Uh, the, you know, God is showing us the the uh, the importance of the, the, the two structures here, but also why it took 440 years when when they already were in the land. Why it took them that long to build a permanent structure? And Glenfield read that God said, "You know what? I'm not interested in the permanent structure because God said I'm not going to live in that building, right? And we're we're going to explore why." God even allowed them to build him a permanent structure, right? But the temple, it says they're going next time, is the temple cannot be built during the time of war. So remember, there was violence, there was bloodshed as a result for more than 400 centuries. The temple could not be built because it was only Solomon. Remember, it was only Solomon on his time, he said in 1st Kings chapter 5. It says that, and he had peace on all sides, sides uh, 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 all around him. So, so it's interesting that Ramban makes a, a very interesting point here. He says that when you look at the book of Exodus, you look at you know Jerusalem, uh, they, they, they conquered that, they, they conquered Jerusalem through war, right? Uh, not only during Joshua's conquest, but uh, even David had to conquer the city of Jerusalem. It was acquired by military conquest. And yet, when you look at the book of Samuel, in 1 Samuel, I believe this is 1 Samuel, in 2 Samuel chapter 24, where the, where the Temple Mount is, or Mount Moriah, what's interesting is Mount Moriah, they did not, children of Israel did not acquire that through military force. He had to buy it. Say that he had to buy it. Huh? Same way in the cave of Machpelah, Abraham had to buy that. Even though they, they technically, hey, they conquered this city, but yet God said, no, it's not going to be by force. You have to buy it. So here we have a record. In, I don't have it there, but in 2 Samuel chapter 24, but the king said to Aravna, no, I insist in, yeah. on buying it from you at a price. He says, I refuse to offer to Adonai my birth, to God my birth offering that cost me nothing. So David brought the threshing floor and the oxen and, uh, for, uh, or for an equivalent of 50 silver shekels. Then David built the altar to Adonai. So that became, remember, go next time. I think I have a slide there. So the Temple Mount was so it's important for us to understand that you know that is where Abraham sacrificed Isaac, and you know God had them. You know it cannot be it cannot be taken by force. It can be taken. God cannot associate Himself with violence. Mm. Amen? Amen. That's why the very holy space where the temple is sitting, he said, no, David, buy it from this guy. And he said, I'll pay you full price, whatever it takes. Amen? So again, the difference between the Mishkan, Mishkan is temporary. Yes? It moves. It moves around. The Mikdash, that Mikdash is what? Permanent. Say that, Permanent. permanent. So what's the connection between the two? So of course, of course, with the Mishkan, the tabernacle, we call it the tabernacle, and the one is a temple. But if you think about the difference, we actually see two different things. We one, the Mikdash 
is or the red habit dash is in a single location you can move it it's so holy in fact that that place where it's it's in the temple mount mount moriah is so holy say it's so holy that even today say even today when we pray we face he's why as if we're standing in front of the temple that's the reason why we're, we're we face these because we're saying god i'm standing in front of your temple in your house amen in Philippines, it would be west. It would be west, yes. Here is east. Because yeah. we are already in the east. <laughs> we have to face west. Amen. Right? If you're in Russia, you have to face south. <laughs> right? So, so one, it, it's a permanent. The Temple Mount is um, uh, uh, the Mishkan. On the other hand, is it moves from place to place. And we're going to see the, the, the spiritual symbolism that the Mishkan represents the holiness that we call portable holiness. Say that portable holiness. Mm -hmm. Portable holiness. We take it with us. Mm -hmm. But the Beth Hamikdash is, is your home, where you live. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about it. It's important where you live. Why? And it's connected in the next, uh, in Exodus chapter uh, 30, which is the next door portion, but in order for them to build that, go to the next slide. They needed the half shekel. Say that the half shekel. The half shekel. We'll talk about the half shekel because I think it, it, it ties in very, very nice. And why? Because the half shekel, again, it says there, when you take the sum of the children of Israel, in other words, when you make a census according to the number, then you shall give every man a ransom for his soul. And the number, it numbers them. So, in other words, you will count the half shekel. You determine, you don't count the heads. But you count the coins. Say you count the coins. Say you count the coins. Verse 13. They shall give everyone that passes among them that are numbered half a shekel. Say the half a shekel. Half a shekel. After the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 giras. Half a shekel is an offering to the Lord. So, so everyone that passes among them that are numbered 20 years and old shall give an offering to the Lord. So here, the half shekel is what? Is for the upkeep of the temple. In other words, they know when they build the when they, they build the first tabernacle, many of the shackles became the foundation, the silver that were the Ark of the Covenant sat. Oh. And they used the shackles, the, the silver, they melted it. Remember when, when they created the boards, it was like an IKEA furniture. There was a peg mm -hmm. there. So they they but in, in, in order for it not to move, because remember, they were in the desert, they placed a silver foundation on the bottom on, and then on the top. So in other words, it was split by two silver silver things on the top. Yeah. And then they inserted a, a wooden pole so that there was it will not move. Mm. Can you imagine, you know, there's, if there's an earthquake, it will be so stable. Why? Because it's like, it's like, it's like an Ikea peg together, but then you put a foundation on top, the silver, and then the bottom. And then plus you put a pole. So, so the silver was, was literally the foundation. Say that foundation. And we learned so, that silver speaks of, redemption. speaks of redemption. Say that redemption. redemption. The foundation redemption. of our structure, amen, amen. is redemption. Sure. Amen. Say that, amen. amen. So the shekel collection, uh, the, the misbat of shekel, equivalent to about thirty to forty dollars today, it was an annual tax that was levied on all males twenty years old and above, and the money was used to finance the acquisition of the animals. The, you know, when the when the when the, uh, when the uh, Beth Hamikdash was established, so they they had to they, there was a sacrifice of the lamb in the morning. And the lamb in the evening, as you know, right? Two lambs every day, mm. plus all the incense, mm. all the oils, all the bread that they needed, uh, you know, every oh, during the year. Goes. So all of that was part of the half shekel donation. Mm. So they said that they collected this. That the fiscal year, they, they, God is an accountant. You know that? 
That's an accountant. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's where I got my accountancy. <laughs> that the, the fiscal year is NISA, Sera NISA. NISA. So they start collecting this. This month is the month of Adar. They start collecting so that by the time Nissan comes, because the, what happens is if you have extra money, you lose it. In other words, you cannot allow, they, they're not allowed to carry for it's like a budget, right? If you don't use the budget, you won't get it next year. Yeah. That's why what do they do? They start spending it. So so here the, the same concept when when it comes to the year end, if whatever excess money they have to give to charity, they cannot keep it because they, they bring in the new the new funds coming in. Amen. Anyway, that's just a uh, detail that you <laughs> in case in case accountants in the room are interested. I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the interesting command about the half shekel, I think I have it. It says that the rich cannot give more and the poor cannot give less. Okay, we're going to talk about that. So, so um, people cannot give less. This, we can understand, you know, why the poor cannot give less. Or, uh, but what about somebody who wants to give more, right? Shouldn't you be encouraged? Okay, you want to give more? Okay, sure. But some of the, the, um, go next, I think I have a, uh, some of the um, some of the uh, simple answer is the reason why the reason why they are not allowed is because it's used as a census. Remember, if somebody gave ten shekels, one person ten shekels, then when you count the shekels, you get confused. How many people did we? Right. So they're saying one of the reasons uh, is is because it's used as a but but they said the census is not used all, every every year, so that is not a valid reason, right? So it says in verse 15, the rich shall give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when you give the offering to the Lord to be a covenant for your soul. So, so here there's some interesting insight on why the rich and the poor give the same. In fact, the shekel, it says, was not used for the census device. Why then did the Torah insist that the rich people cannot give more and the poor cannot give less? So there's some beautiful um, thoughts from the uh, from the sages. He said they understood the concept of the rich and the poor needs to be understood in many ways. The rich is not only meaning rich in money. So what, what, what the, the Torah is saying, a rich person could be somebody who is very talented, who is very charismatic, right? And poor could also mean the opposite, the person who doesn't have a personality or you know he's, he's not very talented you know who, who does not even how to know how to walk properly right so so god is saying you know the story is saying you know the, the rich could mean not only money but also abilities remember as uh, sister ellen read to us this morning it is god who determines your talent say that god determines your talent mm -hmm. some people they are so talented and you wonder, wow, why did God give this guy so much talent? Mm. And there's some people that, you know, are not given that much talent, right? So, so God is saying, you know what? In terms of talents, you know, it, you, you have nothing to do with that. I was the one who determined that. Say that God is the one, is the one. who determined that. So the lesson of the, 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 the half shekel is when it comes to the service of the almighty God, when it comes to when, when it comes to connecting with God, when it comes to the dignity, access to God, the rich and the poor have the same access. Are you still with me? God well, is not a respect. Yes. Jesus. However, what, what God is saying, Hashem will not judge you by what you can do objectively. In other words, your talent. Mm. Because like he said, he's the one who determined, you know, this person will get more talent. <laughs> But what God is saying, I will judge you not by what I have given you. There you go. Oh, that's why you have a parable. Yeah. So Sam, he said, I gave, so he said, I will judge you by how much of your talent you have given. Wow. Yeah. That's why, you know, the parable, if she wants said a parable, it's like kingdom, before he left, he gave people talent, yeah. some five, some two. Someone, but at the end of the day, he said, what did you do with it? And the person who kept it, he said, I was afraid. So therefore, he, he did not even care to, to, give, to share to the world what God has given him. Yeah. 
So the lesson so it says here, <laughs> so uh, Hashem judges you by how much of yourself, say that, how much of yourself have you given to him? Amen. Say that, Elder, say that. How much, how much of yourself, of yourself have you given to him? <laughs> The people in the back. How, uh, Tia, say that. How much of yourself have you given to Hashem? So, like, you know, like, you know, when, when Yeshua was uh, looking at the, the giving in the temple, remember? There was, you know, and what did he say? In Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 12. So it says that there came a certain poor widow and threw in two mites, which make a party. And he called unto him his disciples and said to them, Verily I say to you, this poor widow has cast more than all that have cast into the treasury. For all they have, for all they had, for all they did cast in their abundance. So that for all gave up out of their abundance, but she of her want. Did cast in all that she had, even all her living. See that? Look at that. So she gave what she had. Everything. Everything. People, the other rich people, they gave out of their abundance, their excess. But this person, this widow, poor widow, gave it that he gave. All that she had, even all her living, even the thing that she she needed, she gave. So God said, Yeshua said, this woman gave all more than anybody else mm -hmm. in that room. That's right. And God is saying, you know, it's, it, 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 it doesn't matter what talent God has given you. Some, you know, they have more talents. But God said, you know, what what have you done by, by what I have given you? Have you given it to me? Amen. Mm. So, so again, this all these principles, God bless and yes, all these principles resides on the idea of free will. Very important, free will. Why? Because, like I said, God is the only thing that God will not determine for you and I. He will determine where you're going to be born. He's going to determine whether you're going to have a hair when you grow up or not. <laughs> what color your hair will be? How tall you're going to be? But God will never determine whether or not you're going to be a good person or you're going to be an evil person. That decision, say that that decision, that decision. is up to you and I. That's why, you know, uh, the, the, the you know there's a there's a theology that talks about predetermination. Predetermination um, uh, can never be true. Why? Because because how can God punish you? If you already predetermined, you're going to be bad. Mm -hmm. Or how can God reward you if you already predetermined you're going to be good? So all, all that God promised about rewards and punishment will go off the wall, right? And God is a just God. So that's why, you know, um, it says here that the whole concept, the, the whole purpose of the reward and punishment is to us to make us accountability, to be responsible. Because God is saying, yeah. you know, I've given you this. You know, do with it. You, what, you, you're given a free will. Free will is that you have the ability, because you have free will, you have the ability to make choices and you have the ability to make wrong choices. That's why God said, I'm giving you an out. Yeshua, repentance. So your ability to repent is because you have free will to make the wrong choices. Are you saying with me? Amen. Wow. Say wow. Wow. So in the book of Joshua, it's interesting. He says that the Torah says Moses was a servant of God. He Joshua described Moses as the servant of God. See that servant of God. Servant of God. It says Eved Hashem. Eved means servant. Mm. So the word Eved brings us to a important um, halak or practice. Whatever, uh, whatever an, a, a, a servant owns, the servant doesn't own anything. In other words, if a servant finds a gold Rolex watch on the floor when he was walking in the forest. He finds it. It's not his. It, that Rolex watch, that gold, belongs to his master. Why? Because the servant, say the servant, the servant does not own anything. Yes? Everything belongs to the master. 
So master, so Moses was called the servant of Shem because every single talent he had. Say that every single talent he had. So what they're saying is, you know how 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 high Moses was spiritually. He said, "You and I can be like Moses." Wow! Say wow. Why? Or we can be like Yeshua. Why? Because the moment that we we give whatever talent God has given us, we surrender to Hashem. We can be like Moses. Amen. So, so again, the lesson here: God does not judge us by the size of our talent when we start out. Amen. That was determined by by Hashem. We have nothing to do with that. Hashem judges us by how much and how much of our talents we have utilized. For the service of Hashem. Amen. So the lesson is the rich and the poor stars are equal in the eyes of Hashem. It now all depends on how much of themselves, of ourselves, they want oh, to give right. to Hashem. Right. So, you know, you heard of the, uh, you know, when, you know, we tell our children, the teacher, we tell our children, and the teachers will tell their children, uh, the students, you know, that their kids, one, the only thing that matters is effort. But that's not really true. Why? Because the child who is doing the exam, he had a lot of effort, but he, he answered the wrong questions. So therefore, will he get an A? No. The one that answered the correct answers will get the A, right? Mm -hmm. In work, you can't tell your boss, boss, you know, I work so hard. Where's the report? Well, I'm still working. No, I need a report now. So in, 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 in life, say that in life. Mm -hmm. Say that in life, right. effort, in the world, the effort doesn't matter. Why? Because they're looking at what? The result. At the end of the day, what did your effort achieve? achieve right? Mm -hmm. But, say but. Right. Say but. Right. In God's kingdom, God's kingdom, effort matters. Of course. Effort is the only one that God does. Why? Because the result, say that the result, mm -hmm. is up to God. Amen. We have no, we don't care. That, that's why he said, you know, when you go, I want you to go, just go. God, you know, I went, but, you know, at the end of the day, I have nothing to show. Doesn't matter. Let me take, I just tell you, just do what I told you to do and let me do the rest. Amen. So God is looking at effort. See that effort. Amen. Effort. The world doesn't care about effort, they care about results. But God's kingdom, say, we belong to God's kingdom. God's looking at your effort. Say that God is looking at your Say, wow. So, another lesson on the shekel, don't mess with you, see? The half shekel. What's interesting about the half shekel? Say that the half shekel. We're learning so much about the half shekel. Huh? What do you notice about the half shekel? It's a fraction. Say that it's a fraction. El Eliana is studying fraction. Eliana, what is one half? 50 percent. <laughs> so the question is, the sages are asking, why not a whole? Why not God give them a why not a whole shekel? Why not one shekel? Think about that. Why is it a fraction? Say that. Why is it a fraction? <laughs> that, you know. It's a fraction of the denomination. Why? Why does the Torah ask you to give a, not a whole, but a half? You know why? And here's the answer. Here's the profound answer. You know why? And, and, and uh, uh, Sister Melanie already said that. Because the half is a different. If you have a half, what does that mean? It means it's not complete. Say that it's not complete. If you have a half. You have to look for the other half. Yeah, you need the other half. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a half means it's 50%. You're looking for the other 50% to make it a whole. Amen? Amen. So God is saying, unless, say unless, unless, you give your other half to God, wow. you cannot be complete. Wow. Amen. Wow. Say wow. Oh, so God is saying, ooh, give, my, give your half. Give your, that's what, we're going back to the talent. Give wow. your half. He said, it's a voluntary Give it to me, and I will make you whole. Amen? Amen. Wow. 
So hold on next time. We're gonna we're gonna end soon. We're gonna land soon. But you know, one of the, the hardest you can ask Pastor June this question today is the hardest thing is to not have a home, isn't it? Oh yeah. Can you imagine all of us? You know, most of us we, we are first generation immigrants, right? When we came here, when I came here, um, I, I was I came um, before Eleanor. We only had one son there, Alfie, and I live with my brother-in-law, Michael Macy, and they lived in a condo, and and they had like a, I think it was a two, two bedroom, three bedroom, three bedroom condo, right? But. It, you know, three months came and I couldn't, I was able to find a job. So Eleanor was, because of the flight, she had to come. And then Macy's uh, mother, uh, two brothers, was also scheduled to come the following week. So can you imagine 10, 20, 15 people living in this crowded space? Okay, so, so I know it's very, it's very hard. It's, you say that it's hard. It's hard. So, so, you know, it, yeah, that's how you know. That's how God created you and I. Remember, there's there's three basic needs: food, water, and shelter. Right? Yeah. So you can live without food for days, mm. maybe water, maybe one or two days. But to live without a home is very difficult. You have to hang your hat. You need a place. Say that. I need a place need to, to hang your hat. Otherwise, you will be. You know, you see those homeless. You know, I, I feel for them. You see the homeless yeah. people. On the streets, they, they carry a, a shopping cart and with all their stuff, right? Because there's no place for them to hang their stuff, right? So that's on society. Yeah. So for it teaches that we should look to and help the poor in any mm -hmm. situation. It's a command. So that's something we must do. Mm -hmm. So you see the importance why Hashem designed us. Why? Because God wants us to understand the importance of having a home. Say that having a home. Of home. Amen? Go on next slide. So here, so God said, I want you to, so the question is, why does God need a home? There's two questions here. There's two profound questions. Why does God need a home? He has heaven. Why does he need a home here on earth? Think about that. And then the second question is, if he needed a home so badly, why did he have to ask the children of Israel to do it for him? He could have just snapped his finger and build him a home. Yes. Yeah, he could have done that. But think about it. You know, if you look, if you look at the, the, the Mishkan, huh? look at this, this structure here. 90, I guess 70% of that is made from wood, data from wood, from acacia wood. Where did acacia wood come from? They were in the wilderness. There was no Home Depot there. That's right. There was no Amazon there. Can you bring me 10 logs here? Yeah. Where did they get the logs? Huh? You know, where did they get the logs? You know, when, 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 when Jacob, when Jacob left to go to Egypt, he went to Mount Moriah and, and, the, and the sages said that he took some of the seeds of the acacia tree there yeah, and brought it with him to Goshen. Why? Because he had a foresight that the that the children said we need wood, and then when he died, he, he instructed the same way as Joseph instructed that his bones be carried. He instructed the children of Israel, when you leave, cut this wood. It took 210 years for it to grow very tall. He said, bring this wood with you. And they didn't know why, but, the, but that was the instruction. Jacob said, our forefather Jacob said, when we leave Egypt, cut those trees and bring it to us. Say that, wow. They took it with them. They had caravans. They took it. They cut it. They cut it in a certain length and they took it with them. Say they took it with them. Because there's no there's no acacia tree in the wilderness, in the desert. So the question, where did they get an 80%? 80%. The gold and the silver they got because the, the, the Egyptians gave them to them. The precious stone, the wood, the wood, say the wood. The wood was the key. Yep. Say that the key. The key. And God had a foresight. Told so Jacob, plant the cactus, and it took 210 years for it to grow very tall. Yeah. Wow, say wow. wow. And when they, they, they said, the instruction, he says here, okay, before leaving Bible, before leaving earth, 
basic instruction before leaving Earth. Basic instruction before leaving Egypt. That's their Bible. Yeah. Instead of Earth, it's by Egypt. Basic instruction. So in their basic instruction for leaving Egypt, Jacob said, bring the tree, cut the tree and bring it with you. What we're gonna do with them? Just do it. So they did. Amen. Is there a parallel there when Yeshua carried the wood? Mm -hmm. And he carried the wood to the space of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. They're carrying the wood from Goshen. Wow. Goshen. So, you know, they're bringing it into Sinai to, to, to receive the Torah. Wow. There you go. There's a deeper thought. There. Yes, I mean, indeed. Yeah, all... That's indeed. Yes, indeed. So for sure. Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah. this is uh, so powerful yeah. symbolism, right? Really powerful. Uh, yeah. So again, the, the, the question is, why does God need a home? This is a sacred, holy place, the, the Temple Mount, I said, this is a unique place that even today, even though the structure is not there, we still, people, when you come, I don't know if you've been there, uh, I know you guys have been there, but I've been there, I've not been there, but people who've been there, they said when they, not even non-religious people, that there's a lady, Eleanor was uh, with there. There's a lady in the women's section, and the men's section. And the yeah. lady was saying, yeah. as she was approaching the wall, she was crying. She didn't know why she was crying. Oh. Why? Because there's so much oh. holiness. Yeah. See that oh. holiness. Yeah. Yeah. Kadosh, kadosh. And you, when you touch the wall, it is as if mm. you're connecting to heaven. Mm. That's yeah. my experience. Eleanor's experience too. But you can see a lot of holiness there. Yeah. Why? Because one day Yeshua will return and build the third temple there. So it's talking about so, so 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 we face towards Jerusalem when we pray Hashem. Why does Hashem need a house? We read in the previous parsha Moses went up to Sinai for forty days. He didn't eat. He did not sleep. Then God told him, "Collect the nation, build me a house." And Moses said, well, "Why? Okay, well, how do I build it?" So God gave him instruction on how to build it. So. So God said, don't, don't go to the entire project without collecting. Mm -hmm. So God said, collect the money first, collect the materials first. Mm -hmm. And once you have it, then you start. But today, when they, when, they when they construct something, even, uh, even maybe when you construct a new synagogue, they will, they will start building and then they will ask for the money later. Oh. Okay, come on, you see the building standing, come on, give me money. But for God, no. Let the people give us. Oh and once God. it's given, once it's locked, then let's build it. Amen? Yeah. So God is saying, I want your commitment first. Amen? Yeah. So, so they collected the money. Why, why can't not Hashem just click his finger and build a home? Why do we go through an entire building project? Interesting, Hashem asked first again to collect the money, right? So here it says here um, that the we're going to go back to why God, just think about it. God doesn't need a home. Remember, God said, I will dwell among you and I, right? So why does God need a home? Because what's the next thing? Because it really is, is, is for us. Like I said, Mount Moriah is a very sacred place because that is where Abraham sacrificed Isaac. In fact, going back even before that, it, was, it says that he was in Mount Moriah where the foundation of the earth is, if that's the rock, that's the center. In other words, that's ground zero. That's the center of the earth. And that is where God took the dust and built Adam. It was covered by an Islamic mosque. I lost the mosque right there. It was inside it and it touched the Mariah stone. It was not we weren't supposed to touch it. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yes. And it was also where, where Isaac, when... Uh, it's very special. Very special. When when Isaac was praying for Rebecca to be pregnant, it is there on that Mount Moriah where he prayed. Mm -hmm. It's also where Jacob had his dream. He saw the ladder coming down from heaven. So it's a very holy place. Here's a very holy place. Very a lot of positive energy. That's why you know when we when we come together, you know we we, we are we we become we become the the stone, right? We become the stone. When we come together, there's there's so much energy, positive energy. That's why we can, we can that's why the minion is important. See, when we assemble, when we pray, it's very powerful. We have a quorum. So, so
So there's a deeper explanation. Go on next slide, Joey. There's a deeper explanation because why Hashem allowed them to build him a mishpan. Because Hashem says, you know, you are not impressing me with your maybe with your mitzvah keeping, maybe with your with your uh, you know your your studying the Torah. <coughs> the only thing that impresses Hashem is when we bring things for him in truth. Say that in truth. It has to be genuine, right? Remember, so, so you think about it, you know, uh, I, I, that's why a home is very important. Why is a home very important? Because, because uh, a home, sometimes we, and uh, this is true to many of us, including me, sometimes we act differently when we are at home, right? You are more relaxed. You want to hang your feet when you sit. You don't sit like, hmm. Oh, you go like that, or you put your feet on the floor, right? So, <laughs> so Hashem is saying, is saying Hashem is, is is saying between the two of us, I know your heart. Say God knows your heart. So when we do something, we say, oh, you know, when when we do something, we say, oh, I'm doing this for God, but God said, you, you can't fool me. I can see what's in your heart. I made it. You, you, you're trying to impress uh, these people, you know. So God is saying, the home is really, what God is saying, your home, I want to live in you. Not here, I want to live in you. Where you are, where in your home. Yeah. Amen? So, because in, in the Kabbalah, the, 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 the Bishkan really means the revelation of his essence. The revelation of God. So God says, I want to reveal myself to you where, you know, in the, in where you are. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, you know, uh, prayer is very private. Why? He said, you know, you know, pray when nobody's watching, pray. Pray in your closet, whatever it is. Why? Because it's a time that you are true with God. You, you are pouring yes. your heart to God. God yes. wants the truth from you and I. Amen? Amen. He wants us to to genuinely want to serve him. Amen? Amen. And that is the, 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 the reason why a home is very important. So home, because God is saying, where you are, I want to see where you are. Amen. I want to see where you live. Amen. That's why sometimes you like, Eleanor, you, you eat like, you know, be refined. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. And then the food is all over my clothes. Okay. Because the food is so good that, oh, you can control it. <laughs> Oh, be a, don't be a slob. Don't be a slob. So God said, okay, be very fine. Be fine. Be fine. <laughs> Amen. So the Sam, you know, wants us to what? Uh, there's no one place. He says, I want you, I want to be in your home. I want to reveal myself in your essence. Amen. So to conclude today, we have to end the session somehow. Hashem wants to dwell among us. Amen. So he can reveal his very essence to us and to share the world. We are we partners with Hashem to bring His holiness down into the physical world. Amen. And we do that through the Shua, the living Torah. The more we do, the more we do. So are you partnering with Hashem? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you today. We thank you. We thank you for reminding us Amen. of your ultimate, our ultimate purpose, and that Amen. is to bring you into this world. And Father, we, we pray that you will remove all the dross, all the mud, Amen. all the dust Amen. that's in our life, and make it shine so that Amen. your glory will shine to us as in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. 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 So, uh, we're going to uh, do the bread and the wine first. <laughs> We're going to do the bread and the wine. So I'm going to ask Denzel and Clara to come forward. Um, so the people that are, uh, that Jesse just stopped the recording. You recorded it, right? 